What's going on guys? Welcome into the nighttime edition of the weekly recap video with the wheel strategy. I'm covering up to August 4th, Friday. The first week of August is in the books. I'm going to go over my personal wheel strategy and how it's shaped up because as you know, in my videos, I show you the trades I take, the profits I make and how you can do it too as I bring you along my journey with the wheel strategy. But I'm also gonna cover the broader market. We got the S&P 500 on the screen, the daily chart, and there are some interesting things happening with the S&P 500. We had a pretty nasty red week this week. The, the nastiest red week we've had really since March. So that's what, four or five months ago? That's a pretty big deal. And at a key resistance area too. So we're gonna cover everything. We're gonna start with the market, then we're gonna get into the wheel strategy and what happened with my positions. A lot of interesting things happened with my positions and end up turning out to be a pretty good week. So we have a lot to unpack here. Let's get into it, starting with the S&P 500. So if I zoom in here on the daily chart, the S&P, I mean, look at us. We are below 4,500. Pretty decent move from the peak last week. Um, we had Last week, we had the Fed raise rates. And that, cre that created a big reaction. And then the following day, we had um, other economic data. I think it was uh, PCE, the um, personal consumption expenditures. I believe it was, I'm not 100% sure, but whatever it was, it came in pretty good, better than what we expected. And the market gapped up up here. And that's when it created that top. We had a nasty sell-off later that day, a couple days of recovering, and then a rollover with yesterday, or I'm sorry, Friday, being pretty nasty. If I go to the five minute chart on Friday, you can see just the massive sell-off we had in the afternoon, pretty much around one o'clock on Friday. We just completely rolled over, selling off like 60 points from top to bottom. Pretty big in a couple of hours. So, and if you bring up the weekly chart, this is the biggest one of them all. Just look at the size of this weekly candle. This was a negative 2.27% red week. And this candle, that, that percentage drop is bigger than anything we've seen since way over here, March, early March, when the banking crisis happened, that led to a pretty big sell-off in the market, down 4.5% on the week here. But from there, maybe the biggest crack in the system, we've just been rallying ever since, as if everything's great, um, on the back of the worst news we've had. So, I don't know. That's what's been happening. Big rally since March. And then finally we're having a pretty significant pullback that could possibly get worse. I mean, this is the most bearish week we've had in a long time. So that's all we got. We don't know exactly what's going to happen coming up, but what we do have is the most bearish week that we've had in four months. Uh, just a solid red body closing at the lows, pretty big percentage drop, wiping out the previous two weeks of, of price action. So pretty significant. And like I said earlier in the video, at a significant area of resistance. Um, if I go back here, this is what I've been bringing up in my, my videos recently. This was the next test of resistance. This peak over here created March of last year. And I mentioned how there was kind of two points of resistance, which is marked by these two white lines. There was this one right here around 4,600, just under 4,600. Um, so that would be pretty good resistance. If I, if I went onto the daily chart, you'd see several days of resistance here um, at this area, 4,600. But above that, just above it at 4,630, 4,640 was the bigger resistance, which was the actual peak of this pop right here before we rolled over and never looked back. So that would be the, the major resistance, that, that top, that, the, the pivot high of this area. And we kind of settled between it. If I go down to the daily chart, you can see we did break above the first resistance, just under 4,600. We got above 4,600, but then we didn't really get much higher than that. We didn't test the major resistance, but we got through the, the minor resistance, I guess, and we rejected. We rejected. I mean, resistance and support, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be down to a single penny, a single horizontal line. It's usually a range, and I think that these two lines here together make a pretty solid resistance range. I mean, the range is only 40 points and that's a 
not a lot, not a, not a big range really. I mean, the S&P can make that move in a single day. So a 40 point range isn't that big. So I would just consider the two lines, just one zone of resistance. And that is exactly where we rejected. If I go back to the weekly chart, it makes sense. This is what I've been calling for. If I just kind of go from the, the high of the all time highs, let me, let me get a different line here going. Uh, going from the all-time highs back in 2021, early 2022, um, we have we can we have the potential for a pretty symmetrical move here. Had that first drop retracement, bigger drop retracement, final drop to the lows. Now we go the other way, pop up here, pull back, big pop up here. Now what? Well, you would expect we'd pull back all the way down to maybe around here, again, mirroring the, the left side before we go back to mirror the left side to all time highs. So now if I make this, instead of being dotted, let me let me fill this in here and make it white, clearer to see. You can see uh, if we're gonna have a symmetrical pattern, it would make sense to, for it to look like this. Um, we have this level here mirroring this. This is why I'm having it pull back to around 4,200 because this mirrors this to some extent. Then we have the, the middle here, the all-time lows. We have pivot highs here, pretty similar. Pivot highs here, pretty similar. It's never gonna be identically perfect, right? But this is pretty damn close to being a symmetrical pattern with the all-time lows, not the all-time lows, but the, the lows of the last two years being that that dividing point, that, that the half mark of the symmetrical pattern here. So that is what I've been looking for. I was looking for the major resistance to occur around this top because that's what would make sense for this pattern to be symmetrical. And that's exactly what we got going on here. And if this pattern holds, if what I expect to happen ends up happening, this is what we got right here. This pullback down to this uh, this next level, which, which mirrors this right here, which would be a pullback to around 4,200. It's never going to be perfect, so maybe it's like 4,300 instead of 4,200, but somewhere around this area to where we could drop another one to 200 points over the next couple of weeks. Could be a little bit, could be a bit of a slow bleed, could be a sharp move, who knows, but this is what I would expect the, um, the move to look like. And that is fine. That is perfectly bullish if you really think about it. Because if I bring up the Fibonacci levels, which is something else I've been looking at, another tool I've been using to kind of gauge what the pullback could look like, it, it's fine. I mean, if you look at the bottom from here, this is really the move since March, like I said. It's just been straight up for months. So one massive up leg, a retracement down to 4,200 is just a 50% retracement of this up move. So that's a perfectly healthy, bullish retracement. So we could easily do that. We could still be overall bullish and move higher to new highs. It's very possible. Just because we get a deep pullback doesn't mean the bull market or whatever is over because this is such a massive uptrend, up leg that we've had here. A deeper pullback would be warranted and would be healthy. And the 50% retracement of this massive move would put us around 4,200. So don't be surprised if it gets that bad. And don't run for the hills either because at the end of the day, it could be a healthy retracement in an overall bullish trend. So we'll see what happens. So that was the overall market. Now let's transition into the wheel strategy where I can bring up the graphic here going over my month to date profits and my year to date numbers as well. So August profits so far, just one week in $376. That's excellent. We're going to go over exactly what that is comprised of each, each, every, each and every profitable trade that would that happen this week. And then the year to date profits, so far, just over $3,000. And these numbers were just recently updated and adjusted because of CVS. So we're going to start with CVS. This is a big one because I had just realized a loss recently. And I have then just reversed that loss because I got right back into the position at the same level that I exited it recently, which was all an accident. So, so here is CVS. And for those of you who've been with me this whole time, you know the saga of CVS. Basically, I've been in this for a while. I had 200 shares. My average position was up here at 79.25, and we've been below that for a long time, so it's been pretty ugly. We just started to recover, and I was trying to sell calls uh, underwater, but out of the money enough to expire worthless just so I can collect some premium in an otherwise 
stagnant position, right? Well, my call went in the money at 73 my $73 calls that I sold went in the money. And because it was paying a dividend that week and my my calls were in the money, they were assigned early or they were exercised early and I was assigned early and had to sell my shares at 73. Completely caught me off guard. I should have known because of the dividend that that was gonna be a risk, but it just was not on the top of my mind. It caught me off guard and I had to sell my shares at 73 early. Just unbeknownst to me, the next day I woke up and they were gone. I was assigned early. And my position, again, was up here at 79.25. So I took a pretty big loss by selling at 73. So I realized that in my totals on the graphic on the screen right here. I, I factored it all in. It was like a $1,250 loss on the, on the shares. But what I did was I immediately sold two puts at the 73 strike, hoping to get a sign on those, buy the shares right back at the same price that I sold them at, and just act as if I never sold them in the first place because had I been aware of the dividend and rolled the calls out to account for that this is exactly where I would be I'd still be holding the shares at 79.25 and I'd be in the position right now and that's exactly where I am today because CVS actually closed below 73 this week where I had two puts sold so now on Monday I'm gonna wake up and have 200 shares of CVS all over again and because I bought them back at the same price that I sold them at a few weeks ago, it's as if nothing happened. And that's how I'm treating it. And it was actually a close call. So if we go down to the one hour chart and looking just like the last, pretty much the last week, Monday through Friday, I had two puts sold at 73. And it had earnings this past week. So that was going to be the big deal. I collected a lot of premium because of earnings. And it was just a matter of how are earnings going to be. We went sideways around 74 on Monday. We dipped down in the 73s on Tuesday. So we were close to my puts. They actually had a really good chance of being in the money and me being assigned. Earnings happened. It dipped as far down as 71.63. My puts were in the money in the pre-market. But then when the market opened following earnings, because they, they, they reported earnings in the morning of Wednesday, and that's what led to this drop down here, but when the market actually opened, it rallied like crazy, as high as $77. So at that point, my puts were way out of the money. They expired in a couple days. It was not looking like they were going to get a sign. They decayed like crazy, and I ended up closing them early for a nice profit. So I sold two puts for a net credit of $1.37 each. So $137 bucks per contract, and I sold two. And on... Wednesday, the day of earnings, when I got up to 77 bucks, the puts decayed a lot and I closed them early. I bought them back for five cents and profited overall on the puts $264. So that was it. At that point, I closed the puts, which meant I was not eligible to be assigned at all at 73 and I was ready to move on. I got my nice profit at the very least and I'm ready to walk away from CVS. But then the next day happened, Thursday. And it fell quite a bit. It came back all the way down into the 73s again, as low as 73.60, wiping away a lot of that gain from Wednesday. And at this point, when CVS was down here, I decided to reopen those 73 puts because they were actually paying a decent premium for, for it being already Thursday and them expiring the very next day. I actually collected 20 bucks per contract by selling the 73 strike again on Thursday, which was a lot of premium considering, like I said, they expired the following day. So after closing them for five cents up here, I resold them down here for 20 cents. So I actually, you know, put myself in a better situation. And wouldn't you know it, on Friday, CVS sold off again and I actually got assigned. It got down 11 cents under my strike. 11 cents. Look at here. The horizontal line is where I sold the puts. and We closed just below it. And I am assigned on CVS. And I collected another $20 to do it by reselling the puts. So there's another $20 profit on the week. The CVS puts. Um, 20 bucks there. So now I'm back in the position. As if I never left. And it's honestly funny because I'm actually in a better spot now. Than I would have been had I never got assigned early in the first place. What sucks, though, is that I did miss the dividend here, 
by being called away early, I missed the dividend of 60 cents per share. So I missed out on $120 in dividends. But by missing out on that and being called away early, I was able to sell puts in earnings week and collect great premium. And the net credit I collected by selling puts on CVS, the original ones and then the ones that I sold again, I ended up collecting a total of 304 bucks in put premium, which is a lot more than the 120 in dividends that I would have got had I never been called away at all. So now today, I'm still in CVS as if I never left, but I'm actually in a better position because I've collected a lot more money, income, in the process. So now my break even is a lot better than it would have been. Now my break even is at 7502, just for a reference to see where I stand in the net position. My position on my shares is still up here at 7925, and I look to sell my shares above that level. But for context, my break even, given all the premium and stuff and dividends I've collected to this point, is all the way down at 7502. Now it does suck that CVS did fail to keep these prices, but I'm hopeful that we have somewhat of an inverse head and shoulders going on here and that this pullback is part of the plan where maybe we have a dip here. Here's one next creating the one shoulder, right? Then there's the dip here to the lows. We're popping back up and now we're dipping back down to create the second shoulder before we pop all the way back up to where we started. So again, here is the first shoulder of the inverse head and shoulders. And this pullback right here to 73 would be creating the right side of the inverse shoulder before hopefully pushing back up to where we started in the 90s. That is my wishful thinking as to being okay with this pullback on CVS. So we'll see what happens. But long story short, I'm back in CVS. It's as if I never left and I'm actually in a better spot at the end of the day because of all the put premium I collected to get back into it. So here we are back in CVS. My position is up here. My break even is down here. And now we wait. Next, we'll talk about Virgin Galactic. This is a position I've been in for a little bit. I have 200 shares of $4 per share, and it's been sideways for a while, which is fine because I'm able to sell calls each and every week at or above my cost basis. And I'm just collecting income on call premium each and every week. And it hasn't failed yet and this past week we actually had earnings so the premium on the calls i was able to sell for this week were pretty inflated which is great for selling calls but i wanted to hold out for hope that maybe we could get one of these types of pops after earnings because it's possible for this thing to move so because of that i did not sell calls on virgin galactic first thing monday and that was here and we actually ripped up nicely on Monday. So it was a good thing I didn't sell calls because Virgin Galactic was already on its way up. So great. If I sell calls, that caps my upside. So I didn't want to cap my upside just in case earnings was, was exceptional, right? Stayed up there on Tuesday a little bit, but a little bit lower. But still above four bucks, which is great. And then earnings happened after Tuesday and it dipped down. And it kind of just came back down the rest of the week. Close at $3.72, which is right about where it's been closing. Had a really solid few days above $4. It made a nice push. Ultimately failed by the end of the week. Back down to the 370s, 380s region, which is where it's been. And all my calls expired worthless. Because I did sell calls after earnings. I didn't sell calls before earnings just in case we had a massive gap up. That didn't happen. So on Wednesday, after earnings was over, I was able to sell calls because premium was still good. So I sold call one call at the $4 strike and then another call at the 450 strike just in case there was some more momentum. Who knows? You never know when there's going to be a big pop. So that's what I decided to do. I sold a call at 4 for 19 bucks. I sold a call at 450 for $5, total of 24 bucks. They all expired worthless and I kept the premium for a net profit of $24 on the position. So no more calls sold, I can get rid of these lines here. So now I'm able to adjust my break even on the trade uh, because of the premium I collected and because I had 200 shares, it ends up being a reduction of my break even by, of 12 cents. So I can reduce my break even from $3.54 to $3.42, reduce it by 12 cents. And now my new break even is adjusted way down here. This is acting so great 
for the wheel strategy. Just sitting sideways right near my average and I'm just selling calls week after week after week. They're expiring worthless, but yet the price isn't going far. Like this price isn't tanking and that's why my calls are expiring worthless. They're just, they're just not really going up. So they're just stay, sitting, sitting still and my calls are just, I'm just raking in that call premium and it's reducing my break even all the way down here to $3.42. It's great. The next position I had was with Disney. I sold the $86 put. This is one I've been playing for a few weeks. I sold the $86 strike this past week. I sold the $86 the week before that. And I sold the $85 strike the week before that. So the last three, three weeks, I've been selling puts on Disney. And all three weeks, they've been expiring worthless. If I go down to the 15 minute, you can see here, it was below 86 on Thursday and on Friday, but it ultimately closed above 86. It was a close call. I mean, it only closed 30 cents above my strike, but it happened. I actually ended up closing the puts early. So I sold a put for Disney at the 86 strike. I received $52 for it, but I bought it back on Friday when it was up here for $4. Cool. And that was a net profit of $48 on the trade or 92% of the total premium collected. So that was a fine trade. Now that Disney has earnings coming up next week, I'm deciding not to sell puts on it just because you never know what can happen with earnings. You know, why Why take the chance that a cataclysmic drop could happen due to a, a, a catalyst, which is earnings, when I can just play something else for the same return on investment, but with a more predictable, um, you know, price action coming up. Because I like relying on technicals above everything else. But the only thing that can override technicals is a major catalyst and earnings can be that major catalyst so why bother when i could just go into another name which i did next era energy we'll go to that one and have a relatively safe upcoming week so here's next era next era energy is a utility company they are the largest electric utility in the united states uh, primarily in florida they they own the florida power and light company and they power pretty much all of Florida. And they also have a renewable energy segment as well, which gives them a growthier element. Um, I've been I, I've been doing a lot of research on this company. I just didn't really realize that it was in the good support area for selling puts until last week. And that's what I ended up doing. I closed Disney early on Friday and I immediately rolled that buying power into Next Era Energy, a put that I sold for next week at the $68 strike. And zooming out here on the weekly chart, you can see why that's a fine move. It's been support for two years. And it's not really in a downtrend. It's well consolidating at the highs of this overall move for the past few years. Um, it's kind of reminding me of Occidental Petroleum. If I go to that chart, you can see it had this nice move to the upside. And it's just been kind of chilling around here in a, in a triangle formation. Um, almost a bull flag really for a little while and every time it dips into this green area the support zone it, it pops up it just did it recently and that's what i'm looking at at next era you know we have this uh this massive push up and now we have a bit of a flag going on where every time we go down here in the 70s the, the low 70s high 60s we end up popping up to the 80s so that's what i saw on the chart and with this massive drop that i had this week i'm fine selling a put at 68 in a nice support area where I probably have a good chance of this put expiring worthless, but if it doesn't and I get assigned, well, I'll be at a good price point in my opinion, given the history of the chart. And really, unless there's any big news, the chart and the price action should obey technicals more often than not. And earnings actually already happened on this thing a couple weeks ago. So that big catalyst is out of the picture. And now we're just relying on technicals and the technicals say that this is a good price point to buy so i sold a put at 68 which is actually a more affordable price point than what i was playing with disney disney i was selling the 86 strike um with next era i'm playing the 68 dollar level so it's a lot more affordable on top of it all and i was able to get my 30 percent annualized by selling the put for 45 bucks so that's sold for next week so we'll be watching that one closely and see how it plays out 
We are left with CVS shares and Virgin Galactic shares. I'll look to sell calls on Virgin Galactic first thing on Monday. And with CVS, I'm just going to sit tight and see what happens. So that's where we stand with the wheel strategy. One week of August in the books, and we've already collected $376 in option premium. That's in the pocket, and I'm able to take that out and put it in my bank account should I choose to do so. It's great. I love selling options for income. It's nice passive strategy. It's not super rewarding, but it's very consistent and safe. And that's what suits my personality the best. I appreciate you guys sticking with me and watching my videos. I do appreciate the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please like it. It helps out. Subscribe for more content if you're interested. And as always, I will see you all next time.